Jeremiah chapter 24 is part of a larger section where Jeremiah is speaking to the kings of Judah and to the leaders of Judah shortly before the final conquest of Judah by the Babylonians. Uh, the, the, the conquering of Judah and Jerusalem by the Babylonians happened in several stages over many years. And in the broader context, he's speaking to the kings of Judah shortly before the final conquest of Jerusalem and Judah. Keep that in mind as we take a look at verse 1 of Jeremiah chapter 24. The Lord showed me, and there were two baskets of figs set before the temple of the Lord, after Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away captive, Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and the princes of Judah, with the craftsmen and smiths from Jerusalem, and had brought them to Babylon. Now, it's a little hard to tell if what follows in this short chapter from the book of Jeremiah is a vision, a dream, or whether actually Jeremiah saw it. Maybe he really did go down to the temple and just see a couple of baskets of figs. Or there are indications that it could have been a vision or a dream. We don't quite know. But the point is the same either way. He has in his mind two baskets of figs, it says, somewhere near the temple. Uh, perhaps they were there as some kind of grain offering unto the Lord. Perhaps somebody just left them behind on a shopping trip. We don't really know. But there's two baskets of figs there by the temple. Now notice what else it says there in verse 1. It says, after Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon had carried away captive Jeconiah. King Jeconiah of Judah reigned only a few months, and then he was deposed and exiled. When Nebuchadnezzar came a second time to Jerusalem, that's when these events happened. Now, this was after the short reign of Jeconiah, Therefore, another man is king, a man named Zedekiah, and Zedekiah would be the last king of Judah before the final conquest by the Babylonians. And the other thing you have to understand about King Zedekiah was that he was a puppet set up on the throne of Judah by King Nebuchadnezzar. Before Nebuchadnezzar left Jerusalem and went back to, to Babylon, he said, I'm going to install a king who will be obedient and, and, and good to me. And so he installed Zedekiah under those instructions. Uh, now it says that uh, they had already carried away many people captive. Verse 1 says, the princes of Judah with the craftsmen and the smiths. In other words, they had already had two phases of exile. The first one happened several years before when people like Daniel and his associates were taken. Then came another one shortly before this when more were taken and the final conquest was yet to come. Now, look at this verse 2. You ask, what do the figs mean? What do the baskets of figs mean? Well, that's for verse 2. Take a look. One basket had very good figs, like the figs that are first ripe. And the other basket had very bad figs, which could not be eaten. They were so bad. And the Lord said to me, what do you see, Jeremiah? And I said, figs, the good figs, very good, and the bad, very bad, which cannot be eaten. They are so bad. Okay, you don't have to be a genius to figure that out. He sees two baskets of figs. One basket are good figs. We just planted a fig tree in our backyard a couple years ago, and we're just now, just a couple days ago, Inglo got like the first great fig of the season off of it just perfect, just great. But you know, figs, when they're ripe and good, they're a little bit smushy, you know, they're kind of soft. Can you imagine what overripe figs are like? How gross those are? So you got one basket full of good figs, you got another basket full of terrible figs, rotten figs, so bad that they cannot be. Okay, do you have these two baskets of figs in your mind? Now, here's the twist. You might think, okay, great. The good figs are the righteous. The bad figs are the unrighteous. The good figs are the people who didn't get carried away into captivity. The bad figs are the ones who did get carried away into captivity. And there, you'd be wrong. Take a look now, starting at the next verse, starting at verse 4. We read, Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Like these good figs, so I will acknowledge those who are carried away captive from Judah, whom I have sent out of this place for their own good into the land of the Chaldeans. That's the Babylonians. For I will set my eyes on them for good, and I will bring them back into this land. I will build them and not pull them down, and I will plant them and not pluck them up, and I will give them a heart to know me that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, and they shall return to me with their whole heart. 
So God says, first let me tell you about the basket of good figs. What about the basket of good figs? Look at it there in verse 5. Like these good figs, so will I acknowledge those who are carried away captives from Judah, whom I have sent out of the place for their own good. Now, judgment had come to Judah as a whole and was to come to Judah in an even greater measure. And it would be very easy if you were left behind in Jerusalem to say, Woo, am I glad God must be pleased with me because I didn't get taken away by the Babylonians into, uh, into captivity. I stayed behind. God must smile upon me and I must be in special favor. And you know what God says? No, just the opposite. Those people who are already carried away. Now, when I think about the already people carried away, think about Daniel, Daniel and his companions. They were in the very first wave. God says, they're the blessed ones. They're the good figs. You people who got left behind in Jerusalem, you're the bad figs. You thought that you were the objects of God's special favor. I'm telling you that you're like the bad figs and the people already taken away to captivity are the good figs. Now, there's one thing I want you to understand here, a principle that I think is worthy to mention. When judgment comes upon a nation, people who are not directly responsible for the sins that brought the judgment on the nature, nation, suffer. I mean, th this is just in the nature of things, is it not? When judgment comes upon a nation, comes upon a people, there are, for example, children who suffer because of the judgment that came upon the nation. And the children weren't directly involved in the sin, but they suffered, do they not? So it's easy for us to think, well, God, how unfair of you. You just look at them all and you go, oh, wipe them all out, you know, on and on. And God says, no, even when I'm judging a nation, I know how to distinguish between the good figs and the bad figs. Even when I'm judging a nation, I know the state and the status of each individual heart, and I will deal with them on that level. Friends, don't ever think that just because judgment comes to a nation or a people or a group that God has lost the distinction between the righteous in that group and the unrighteous. That God has lost the distinction, if I could say it, between the good figs and the bad figs. He still knows who they are. But here's the other aspect of it. Sometimes the way that works out is unexpected to human nature. We would not have expected that God says the good ones are the ones who are already carried away captive. That's why he says in verse 6, I will set my eyes on them for good, and I will bring them back to this land. Those people who were represented by the good figs would be blessed even in their captivity. God promised to bring them back to the land, and they would be among those who came back to Judah with Ezra and Nehemiah starting about 538 B.C. Now, you see, there was a blessing for those who were first taken in the exile because they would be among those who were first to go back to the land when the opportunity was given. And God says in verse 6, I will build them up and not pull them down, and I will plant them and not pluck them up. When they returned to the land, God would not, uh, God would, I would say, he would establish them securely again. And then he continues on in verse 7, then I will give them a new heart to know me that I am the Lord. Now, when we read those verses here in Jeremiah chapter 24, they sound an awful lot about like the new covenant passages that we will come to in the book of Jeremiah. Friends, I just want to build your anticipation up in a few weeks when we get to the new covenant passages of the book of Jeremiah. And this is what I would call a partial new covenant passage. In other words, he's using many of the themes that he will announce in the new covenant to come some of those themes like, a heart to know me, they shall be my people, they shall return to me with their whole heart. He's using those, but in my view, there's some people who might dispute this, but in my view, he still has in mind the return from exile. And friends, there is a sense which there was a very wonderful change of heart in the people of Israel when they came back into the land after the exile, after the Babylonian captivity. You know what that big change of heart was? Now, the big change of heart was simply this. 
before Israel went into captivity into Babylon, their biggest problem that God had to adjust to the prophets again and again and again was idolatry. Baal and Ashereth, Baal and Ashereth, Ashereth and Molech, Molech and Baal, on and on and on. It was these pagan gods of the Canaanites. That was their biggest problem all the time that God had to address before they went into exile. Friends, after exile was over, when they came back, you find very little problem in Israel them messing around with Baal or Ashereth or Molech. It cleansed them of their idolatry. I'm not trying to say that all their spiritual problems were over. There were still things God had to deal with in their life. But there was a definite change when they came back from the Babylonian exile. And this is what God is referring to when he uses this wording, I will give them a new heart to know me. So I regard this as using the gathering from exile as a prefiguring of the ultimate fulfillment of the new covenant that we're going to see in the later chapters of the book of Jeremiah. All right, that's the good figs, the people already taken away in captivity. Should we look at the bad figs? Let's taste the bad figs, beginning here in verse 8. And as the bad figs, which cannot be eaten, they are so bad, surely thus says the Lord, so will I give up Zedekiah, king of Judah, his princes, the residue of Jerusalem who remain in the land, and those who dwell in the land of Egypt. I will deliver them into trouble, into all the kingdoms of the earth, for their harm to be a reproach and a byword, a taunt and a curse in all places where I shall drive them. And I will send the sword, the famine, and the pestilence among them till they are consumed from the land that I gave to them and their fathers. And please notice this. Verse 8, he says, As the bad figs which cannot be eaten, so will I give up Zedekiah. Not everybody in Judah was like the good figs. There were bad figs there. And what does God say that, to them? Verse 9, I will deliver them into trouble into all the kingdoms of the earth. Virtually all of the people of the kingdom of Judah would be carried away as captives, be carried away as exiles. And in God's plan, it was better to be taken earlier into exile. Now, before we leave this, I just want you to think, what would it have been like if you lived in Jerusalem in these days when Nebuchadnezzar comes and he takes away a bunch of people and you're left behind? It would be very easy for you to think, God is very pleased with me. They got taken away. I was left behind. And then Nebuchadnezzar comes back again and he takes more people and you're still left behind. And now you're thinking, wow, I am the special apple of God's eye. Look at how pleased God is with me. Friends, isn't it amazing how easy it is for us to take spiritual pride when we have no reason to take it whatsoever? And I don't know how this might apply to your life. If I sat down and think about it, I think about some ways it could apply to my life. But it's just very easy for us to think that we are spiritually superior to somebody else when we have no reason for thinking it whatsoever. And that was the case with the good figs. The bad figs thought they were the good figs. And God says, no, 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 let me set you straight on that. Now, starting in verse 1 of chapter 25. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Joas, Josiah, king of Judah, which was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, which Jeremiah the prophet spoke to all the peoples of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying... All right, a couple things we've got to set here. First of all, we've got to set the general time. Here, he's taking us back to the fourth year of Jehoiakim. This is before the reign of Zedekiah, many years before the reign of Zedekiah. Uh, just to give it a quick estimation, about seven years before the reign of Zedekiah. Why have we jumped back so quickly? Well, look, sometimes the book of Jeremiah just jumps around. I like the suggestion from one Bible commentator named G. Campbell Morgan. G. Campbell Morgan says that what Jeremiah is doing right here is he's relating a vision that he had back in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, but he's relaying it to King Zedekiah right there in the present day. He's saying, remember what God spoke to me many years before? I think that's the sense of it right here. That's one sense, the biblical anchor for this. The other thing, the fourth year of Jehoiakim was a pivotal year in world history. 
I'll tell you what happened in that. I doubt if it's on the tip of anybody's tongue. It's when the Babylonians defeated the Egyptians at the Battle of Carchemish. Now, Carchemish is a city at the fords of the Euphrates River uh, on the Turkey side, uh, the Turkish side of the Euphrates in the modern-day map, right across the border from Syria on the modern-day map, and there was an epic military battle that happened there in 605 BC. And it was the battle that established that the Babylonians ruled that area of the world. That was the battle that established them as the superpower of the world against the Egyptians who were trying to exercise their influence and keep the Babylonians down. So it was a pivotal year for world history, but after Nebuchadnezzar defeated the Egyptians at Carchemish, then he came down to Jerusalem and invaded Jerusalem. So it was an, this was the year of the first invasion of Nebuchadnezzar on Jerusalem. So it's this earth-shaking thing. And personally, I believe that these particular prophecies that Jeremiah gave happened in between those two events. So Babylon is the undisputed world power because of the victory at Carchemish. They're on their way down to Jerusalem, and the whole world is wondering, what are they going to do? How are they going to reign? What kind of power are they going to be? And God's going to answer those questions with the prophecy in Jeremiah chapter 25. Here we go now, verse 3. From the 13th year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even to this day is the 20th year in which the word of the Lord has come to me. And I have spoken to you, rising early and speaking, but you have not listened. And the Lord has sent to you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, but you have not listened to them, nor inclined your ear to hear. They said, repent now, everyone, of his evil way and his evil doings, and dwell in the land that the Lord has given you and your fathers forever, forever. Do not go after other gods and serve them and worship them, and do not provoke me to anger with the, words of your hand, with the works of your hands, and I will not harm you. Yet you have not listened to me, says the Lord, that you might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. Okay, first of all, verse 3 do you see the time marker there? Jeremiah says it was the 23rd year of his ministry. Friends, that's about halfway through his 40-year career as a prophet. That's an interesting thing, being halfway through your career, isn't it? You're no longer the rookie. You're no longer the young guy doing the work. You've got a lot of experience. You've got a lot of credibility, but you've still got a lot more to go. And that's where Jeremiah was when he delivered this prophecy. He had been it for 23 years. But what was the result? Look at verse 3. But you have not listened. Despite his many years of faithful service to God and to the people, they did not listen to Jeremiah. And they also did not listen to the other servants of the prophets that God sent to them. And what was the message of these other servants and Jeremiah? Verse 5, repent now, everyone, of his evil way and of his evil doings. This was the message of Jeremiah and the other faithful prophets around him. Do you remember the last time we were in the book of Jeremiah a couple weeks ago tonight? I explained how there was a difference between the message of Jeremiah and the message of the false prophets. The message of Jeremiah and the true prophets was, repent. The message of the false prophets was, relax. Don't worry about that kind of stuff. And there was a big contradiction between those two messages. Well, Jeremiah and those allied with him, they brought the faithful message, but the people did not listen to it. That's why it's repeated in verse 7, yet you have not listened to me. That's the great crime. Friends, I'm going to say this again. I feel like almost every night in Jeremiah I say this. But I think it's relevant and it's important. It's something I try to remember from my own life, and I hope you'll remember it. The most important thing you can do is listen when God speaks to you in His Word. If you will listen when God speaks to you in His Word, God can do anything with you. you. You think that the big problem is your sin. It's almost as if God says, man, your sin is an easy thing for me. If you'll just listen to me when I speak to you in my Word, I'll guide you through dealing with your sin. But you have to listen to me. 
I get afraid sometimes. And maybe it's an unfounded fear. I'd be very happy to learn that this was an unfounded fear. That there are many people who are churchgoers and seek to live the Christian life, that when it comes to listening to God, basically they walk around like this. Speak to me, Lord. Guide me, God. You know, you need to sit down and just say, God, I want to listen to you in and through your word to me. You've given me your word. I want to listen to it. And you will teach me. When I'm in sin, you'll teach me. You'll show me. When I need guidance, you'll teach me. You'll show me. God can do anything with a man or a woman who will listen to him as he speaks through his word. But this is what they would not do. So what would happen? Look at verse 8. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, says the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land, against its inhabitants, and against these nations all around, and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment a hissing and perpetual desolations. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voice of the the, excuse me, the sound of the millstones and the light of the lamp, and this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. First thing to notice in verse 8, look how God introduces himself. It's as if... Well, let, let me put it to you. There's all different ways somebody can introduce themselves to you, can't they? You say, hi, uh, you know, I'm so-and-so. Nice to meet you. That, that's an introduction, isn't it? There's another way sometimes people make an introduction. They, they pull out a badge and they say, hi, I'm officer so-and-so. Here's my introduction to you. It, it's a different flavor between the two introductions, is it not? God is taking out the military metaphor. When God calls himself the Lord of hosts, as he does in verse 8. Hosts speaks of heavenly angelic armies. It's like God's putting, and I hope this isn't a disturbing figure to anybody, but I, I think it's, it's accurate in spirit of it. It's like God putting on his general's uniform and saying, here I am, I'm speaking to you now as the general, the captain of the Lord's armies, listen up to me. Okay, God, you got our attention right now. What does he say to him? Verse 9, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land. Friends, do you see what he's saying there in verse 9? The conquering king of Babylon was God's servant against the people of Judah. He said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, God. He's a pagan king. Who knows how many worthless heathen idols he worships? Well, wait a minute, God, he's a wicked man. It's Nebuchadnezzar. God says, no. When it comes to performing the work of judgment upon my people, he is my servant. He's my messenger doing my work. And what's he going to do? Verse 9, he's going to make them an astonishment, a hissing, a perpetual desolation, desolation. As Jeremiah did so many times before, He announced the coming Babylonian conquest of Judah and Jerusalem. Matter of fact, in verse 9, if you see the phrase, it says, He will utterly destroy them. Friends, this is a heavy phrase. Because when he says in verse 9, I will utterly destroy them, he's using a phrase that's used especially in the book of Joshua for what the, the Hebrew word is something like harem. It means to carry out a holy war of total destruction. God says, that's what I'm sending Nebuchadnezzar to do against Judah and Jerusalem. Friends, the judgment's coming. That's what God's announcing through Nebuchadnezzar. Now, look at verse 11. These nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. 70 years. Here God gave Jeremiah an additional revelation. Friends, all through the book of Jeremiah, we've been reading judgments coming from Babylonians, judgments coming from Babylonians, judgments coming from the Babylonians. Almost every week we talk about it. Here's something new. Judgments coming from the Babylonians, and it'll last 70 years. God just put 
an expiration date on it. He put a clock on it. He said that the forced exile of the people of God out of the promised land would last for 70 years. Now, there are many Bible scholars and commentators and such who believe that the 70 years is a symbolic number. It's a symbolic number referring to a long time. And they say, well, it's kind of almost 70 years, but not quite. But friends, there's good evidence to believe that when God said 70 years, He meant 70 years. There's good reason to believe this. I'll quote from a man named Charles Feinberg. He says, on the other hand, there are many who take the number of years to be precise, namely from the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, to the end of the Babylonian dynasty with the coming of Cyrus in 2 Chronicles chapter 36. They hold that the reckoning must be precise because it was Daniel who was among the first captives who said that the 70 years were fulfilled. And friends, I just got to believe that if Daniel said it was 70, it was 70. Now look, I'm not trying to say that this ends all the questions about it. There are definitely questions and difficulties with the chronology, but my inclination whenever you have a biblical number like this is to take it as literal unless there is overwhelming evidence to the contrary. And the fact that Daniel seemed to regard it as a literal number seems to argue very strongly that God intended it to be a literal number. Now, what's going to happen after the 70 years? Take a look here, starting at verse 12, he says. Then it will come to pass when 70 years are completed that I will punish the king of Babylon for that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, says the Lord, and I will make it a perpetual desolation. So I will bring on that land all my words which I pronounced against it, all that is written in this book which Jeremiah has prophesied concerning all the nations. For many nations and great kings shall be served by them also, and I will repay them according to their deeds and according to the works of their own hands. Seventy years would not only mark the length of the exile that was forced upon the people of Judah, but it would also mark the length of Babylonian domination. Because after those 70 years, they would be conquered by the Medes and the Persians who would take over and establish a new empire. God says the clock is ticking upon the Babylonians. Please understand this, friends. God said that Nebuchadnezzar was his servant, did he not? Yet, he would still judge him because in the service that Nebuchadnezzar did for God, he didn't do it from his heart. He didn't do it willingly. In other words, nobody should think this. Nebuchadnezzar was Oh, I love the people of God. I love the people of Israel. All I want to do is bless them. And mean old Yahweh is making me conquer Jerusalem because I'm his servant, when really all I want to do is bless them. Does anybody think it worked like that for a moment? Friends, let me tell you how it worked. A wicked man had a wicked thought in his heart, and God guided him even in his wickedness to accomplish his ultimate end. For Nebuchadnezzar, it was nothing but wickedness that prompted him to do what he did, but God used it to bring a righteous judgment upon Judah, just as Jeremiah prophesied. Therefore, Nebuchadnezzar cannot stand before God and say, hey, I was your servant. You used me. Now, I don't want to get off into a side issue. The whole case of Nebuchadnezzar is complicated because Daniel seems to indicate that he did turn to the Lord later in his life. So I'm setting all that aside, okay? Let's set that aside. But apart from that, we have this amazing instance of God can use a person, and that person can still end up in ruin. Don't you wonder sometimes what Judas might say to God? that Judas might come to God and say something like this, hey, you should be thanking me. If I don't betray Jesus, then he doesn't go to the cross and the sins of the world aren't paid for. You should be thanking me for what I did. Does anybody have that crazy thought? Friends, let me tell you, Judas would never dare think that thought in God's presence, much less say those words. Why? Because it was no credit to Judas whatsoever, 
even though God used his wicked actions. Don't ever think that just because God uses a man or a woman, that that man or woman is necessarily justified in the eyes of God. It wasn't true for Nebuchadnezzar. It wasn't true for Judas. It's been true. Uh, it hasn't been true in many cases. Okay, now, that's God dealing with the Babylonians. Here, he's going to increase his vision from verse 15 to the end of the chapter. And we don't have to spend a lot of time on this. We're mostly just going to read through it. But check out how God is going to pour out his judgment upon the nations. Verse 15. Thus says the Lord God of Israel to me, Take this wine cup of fury from my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. And they will drink and stagger and go mad because of the sword that I will send among them. All right, you ready to put a picture in your mind here? It's the picture right here from Jeremiah chapter 25. God says, what did he say? Take this wine cup of fury from my hand. Now, you know, if I was really a, a better preacher and had better presentation here, I would have established a goblet right here, you know, just a big goblet. And not only that, but I've got to use some of this fog or smoke stuff that they're using for the VBS. And I would have put that in it, and it would have looked like something from a Hansel and Gretel movie, you know, where you hand it out in front of the, come, my little dearie, drink of this, you know. And it's just all this potion overflowing this. Friends, that's the idea right here. God has a wretched cup that he holds out and he says, drink it. And as we're going to see in the coming verses, the nations might say, oh, I don't want to drink that. No, thank you. Um, I've given up drinking. God says, no, you're going to drink this. There's no option to this. He holds out this cup before the nations. Now, several times in the Old Testament, a cup is presented as a powerful picture of the wrath and judgment of God. Let me read you just two passages. Psalm 75, verse 8. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red, it is fully mixed, and he pours it out. Surely its dregs shall all the wicked of the earth drain and drink down. Whoa. How about this from Isaiah chapter 51, verse 17? Awake, awake! Stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. You have drunk the dregs of the cup of trembling and drained it out. Do you see what we're talking about is a figure of judgment? God holds the cup out before those who he's going to judge, and he says, drink it. You've got to drink the whole thing. You've got to drain it down. Now, friends, before I move on, to Jeremiah. Does this have any suggestions in people's minds about a prayer that Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he was crucified? What did Jesus pray? One of the things he prayed in that garden was this, Father, let this cup pass from me. If it's possible, and I'm paraphrasing the prayer of Jesus, if it's possible to accomplish the salvation of humanity any other way, I don't want to drink this cup. Let it pass. Do you understand the cup that God was talking about there in the Garden of Gethsemane? Do you understand that in Jesus' mind, in his soul, he could see that foaming, wretched, poisonous cup of the wrath of God, and he knew that if he went to the cross, he would drink it. And friends, here's the point. Who deserved to drink that cup? I'll put it to you this way. Uh, w when your kids were growing up or when you were growing up, did you ever have it where the kids would have their own little cups or something and, and maybe have their little name on it? Friends, this is what I know. That on that cup that was held before the Son of God in the Garden of Gethsemane, my name was on that cup. That cup was appointed for me. I suppose it's a pretty big cup. It could hold your name too. And what Jesus said is he said, Father, I don't want David to have to drink that cup. I will drink it. It's appointed for him. He deserves it, but I'll drink it. I'll drink it because I can take it and he can't. 
It will destroy him if he takes it. He can't stand under your wrath, but I can. I will drink it. So friends, when we have this very powerful image of the cup of the wrath of God, understand how it connections to the redemption that Jesus Christ won for us on the cross. Now he says, verse 15, cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it, verse 16, they will stagger and drink and go mad because of the sword that I will send. God says, when I send this judgment, when I make them drink this cup, it's not like they're going to be happy drunks. They're going to be staggering. They're going to be in pain. They're going to be in, as if they're crazy because of this drink that I give to drink them. Now, please understand this, people. Please understand it in two ways. First of all, I, I almost hesitate to use the phrase because in my mind it has very unpleasant associations. But some years ago there were people talking about God or, or, or his servants being a Holy Ghost bartender. Friends, let me tell you something. This is the kind of drink that God serves of his wrath. And you want no part of this. Secondly, I want you to notice this. When he gives this cup and he tells them to drink it and he says they're going to drink and stagger and go mad, there's something characteristic of cultures before they're judged by God. Oftentimes, it seems that sanity leaves them. They're crazy. They're crazy. And friends, I'll be straight with you. That makes me fear for Western civilization in general and for the United States of America specifically. When I see the things that capture the interest of Americans and Western culture, when I see the things that are really important, oh, the, the top priorities for us to pursue, and the things that, it seems like madness, madness, that these are the things that our culture is focused upon. And it makes me afraid. It makes me weep that maybe we've already been given this cup and we're already staggering in our madness. And the judgment is not far away. Now, if all of that were true, what it would be impressed upon us to do is to love God and trust Him and keep short accounts with Him and to preach the gospel with all our might all the more. Let me continue on here, verse 17. Then I took the cup from the Lord's hand and made all the nations drink to whom the Lord had sent me, Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, its kings and its princes, to make them a desolation, an astonishment, a hissing, and its princes, uh, excuse me, and a curse as it is this day. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and his servants, his princes, and all his people, all the mixed multitude, all the kings of the land of Uz, and all the kings of the land of the Philistines, namely Ashkelon, Gaza, Ekron, and the remnant of Ashdod, Edom, Moab, and the people of Ammon, and the kings of Tyre, the kings of Sidon, and the kings on the coastland, which are across the sea, Dedan, Tema, Buz, and all those who are in the farthest corners, all the kings of Arabia, and all the kings of the mixed multitude who dwell in the desert, all the kings of Zimri, all the kings of Elam, and all the kings of the Medes, all the kings of the north, far and near, one with another, and all the kingdoms of the world which are on the face of the earth, also the king of Shishak shall drink after them. In other words, he takes this cup, and obviously this is done symbolically. In symbolically way, he gives it to all the nations and to all the worlds. He goes, judgment is coming. Now, friends, this points to two things. It points in a smaller way, in a lesser way, to the judgment that God was going to bring upon the whole region through the Babylonian army. But more specifically, it points to the end of all things and the judgment of the nations at the end of the age. And there will be such a judgment of the nations at the end of the age. It's going to come. I don't know if it's near or far, but it's going to come. And God says, there's going to come this time when every man, every woman, every nation will be held to account. Verse 18 tells us that it's going to begin at Jerusalem in the city of Judah. Friends, this is a principle. Judgment always begins at the house of God. Always. But listen, when God is performing his judgment upon his people, if the rest of the nations were smart, they'd get right with him right away. 
Because they'd say, if judgment has come upon the house of God, it's going to come upon us for sure next. And that's what God was announcing in and through this. And so he gives this big, long list. You heard the list that I read of all these conceivable nations. He wraps it all up at the end by saying, all these nations will be led to drink. And then at the very end, did you see that? Verse 26, also the king of Shishak shall drink after them. And everybody said, amen. Wait, do you even know what you're saying amen to? Does anybody know what Shishak is? I, I didn't know. I had no clue. I mean, I had to look it up this week. But let me explain to you what Shishak is. It's really kind of interesting. Shishak is a code name for Babylon. And it uses a special ancient Hebrew code known as an atbash. An atbash is an alphabetic code where you substitute the first letter of the alphabet for the last letter of the alphabet, and the second letter of the alphabet for the second to the last letter alphabet. And you substitute those. If you do that in the Hebrew alphabet, and you do it to the, uh, the word Babylon or Babylonia, you come up with Shishak. So he's speaking in code. You say, well, why? What's the point of this? Friends, the army of Babylon is coming down upon Jerusalem and is ready to contact them. They probably wrote the name Babylon in code sometimes because they feared that their messages would be intercepted by spies or by Babylonian agents and that they would be liable, they would be known as collaborators. So they used code from time to time. And God says, even in code, Babylon is going to be judged. Anyway, verse 27. Therefore you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Drink, be drunk, and vomit. Fall and rise no more because of the sword which I will send among you. It shall be if they refuse to take the cup from your hand to drink, then you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, You shall certainly drink. For behold, I begin to bring calamity on the city which is called by my name. And should you be utterly unpunished? You shall not be unpunished, for I will call for a sword on all the inhabitants of the earth, says the Lord of hosts. They said, no, we don't want to drink it. God says, you're going to drink it. You cannot escape my judgment. You cannot opt out of this. He's going to bring it. And that's why he says, verse 29, I will call for a sword on all the inhabitants of the earth. Friends, I want you to notice this. Yes, Babylon is in view. But ultimately, the judgment of the world in general is in view. Does it surprise anybody that in the book of Revelation, the economic system and the religious system of the end times is described as what? In Revelation chapter 17 and 18, it's described as Babylon. God's drawing back from these same images of world judgment and bringing them back into the book of Revelation. Matter of fact, he's going to continue on that imagery that will tie back to the book of Revelation in the following verses. So look at here at verse 30. Therefore prophesy against them all these words and say to them, the Lord will roar from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He will roar mightily against his foes. And he will give a shout as those who tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. A noise will come to the ends of the earth, for the Lord has a controversy with the nations. He will plead his case with all flesh. He will give those who are wicked the sword, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, disaster shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the farthest parts of the earth. And at, the, at that day, the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented or gathered or buried. They shall become refuse on the ground. Friends, let me say this. This is remarkably like the description of the battle of Armageddon in Revelation chapter 19. That's what Jeremiah is looking forward to in the longer prophetic vision where God, verse 30, will roar like a lion from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation. It's like Jesus says, the days of the Lamb of God are past. Now it's time for the lion of the tribe of Judah 
to preside over the earth. And it goes forth a shout and disaster, and the slain of the Lord cover the earth. Verse 34. Wail, shepherds, and cry. Roll about in the ashes, your leaders of the flock. For the days of your slaughter and your dispersions are fulfilled. You shall fall like a precious vessel, and the shepherds will have no way to flee, nor the leaders of the flock to escape. A voice of the cry of the shepherds and a wailing of the leaders to the flock will be heard. For the Lord has plundered their pasture, and peaceful dwellings are cut down because of the fierce anger of the Lord. He has left his lair like the lion, for their land is desolate because of the fierceness of the oppressor and because of his fierce anger. Now, in the very beginning of this broader section, going all the way back to Jeremiah chapter 24, God was addressing mainly the kings of the people and the shepherds over them, shepherds meaning kings and rulers. He says, in this judgment, you kings and you rulers, you will have a special responsibility. Friends, I don't know what all that means. I honestly don't, but I will say this. That the leaders, political, military, economic, uh, religious, spiritual, if you will, the leaders of a nation in judgment will face a special accountability before God. He announces it here when he says, wail, shepherds, and cry, verse 38, because of the fierceness of the oppressor and because of his fierce anger. Now again, like many nights in the book of Jeremiah, we get to the end of our appointed chapter and we go, Oh, that is a lot of judgment. Friends, two things to consider here in conclusion. It is a lot of judgment. And it is the goodness and the graciousness of God to warn us about it before it happens. Now look, if there is no God, if there is no judgment... If Jeremiah is just a guy who just wrote things that came to his mind and none of it has God behind it, then all of these words isn't going to make it real and it's not going to make it happen. We know that. But let me tell you something. If there is a God and there is a judgment that we all have to answer for, all our wishing it would go away isn't going to make it happen. It's real and we have to be ready for it. How could anybody be ready for this? Okay, here's the last point. The fierceness of his anger, the terror of his judgment, all of this. This is what I want you to think of. Whenever we read these passages about the fierceness and the terrible nature of God's judgment, this is what I want you to consider. This is what was poured out upon Jesus on the cross. He bore the fullness of the wrath and the judgment of God. If, if you read this, and like me, you go, man, that's a lot. Wow, that's over the top. Boy, this is big. Friends, I want you to understand, all of that was poured out upon Jesus. Why? So that it might not be poured out upon you and anyone who comes to God in repentance and faith and puts their faith in Jesus Christ. The good news is this does not have to be the necessary destiny of anybody. But Jesus Christ bore it all on the cross. And he says, trust in me. Come to me in terms of surrender. And I'll free you from this. I'll protect you in the midst of it. And I will bear the wrath that you deserve. I will drink the cup that had your name upon it. Father, that's our prayer. I pray that everybody in this room, everybody who might listen to this later, everybody, Lord, who might uh, see it on a video or whatever, Lord, I pray for each and every one of them that they would be spared this wrath to come because they put their faith in Jesus Christ and in his great work. And Jesus, we say, thank you Lord, we, we read these descriptions of your judgment and we feel it's over the top. 
we feel it's so extreme. And we just say, thank you, Jesus, for bearing it for us. We love you, Lord. And we thank you for your kindness to us. Pour out your grace upon us and give us wisdom and heart and passion to reach a world that seems mad, that seems crazy under the staggering cup of your judgment. In Jesus' name, amen.